welcome to Field Sports Britain, which this time comes from the English Lake District. And I am standing on top of Rhinos Pass. No rhinos. Coming up, we're going fell hunting with the Coniston Foxhounds. That's hunting fells, not foxes under the new legislation. We are wildfowling with the Grange Wildfowlers on the terrifying sands of Morecambe Bay. And now, what's the English Lake District really famous for? Lakes. We're going fishing. Well, I'm here with Geoffrey Olsted from the British Association for Shooting and Conservation, but he used to be the BBC Radio Cumbria bloke. And why have you brought me to a yacht marina outside Windermere instead of to a pike lake, Geoffrey? Well, there is a connection. But I was sent out in a story that in Windermere there was a man-eating pike. And we're not talking about something that just nibbled people's toes. This swallowed them whole, right? <laughs> I didn't believe this, cynical journalist. But it was true. Good Lord, look at the size of it. Well, really, this was made for a film. They were going to make a follow-on to Jaws. And the idea was this would be a British Jaws. And it was going to be set on Windermere with a man-eating pike, terrorising the tourists. You see, it's great stuff. And unfortunately, they built um, an electronic one which actually moved. It was articulated, it would dive, it would do all sorts of things. But they never learnt an important lesson. The first submarine they built in Barrow sank. <laughs> When they brought their articulated, all-electronic working pike here to Windermere to try it in the lake, it sank. The film was never made. Joan Collins, I believe, was signed up for a starring role, but she's never been eaten by a pike. I think we had a very, very lucky escape there. Now, let's go off and find some real pike, shall we? It's off to Rydal Water, where we meet an ambassador for Lakeland Angling, David Stocker. He fishes for all sorts of fish. Today, it's pike. Pike being creatures of the shadows, we start on the dark side of the lake. Our lures may be state-of-the-art, but they're not bringing in the fish. What's so intriguing about them is compared with trout and salmon that I've fished for extensively in the past, uh, I find them probably the most unpredictable of fish. They're, they're quite astonishing. But what they have in their favour is that they are the genuine article. They are wild. They're not like um, fishing an overstocked carp pond. You can't really stock waters with pike and create good pike fisheries. So you really are fishing for the apex predatory fish um, in places where they are totally wild. What's intriguing about them in particular is that um, given their kind of shark-like quality, like a big mouth full of teeth, they are actually the most delicate of all the freshwater fish uh, in terms of their response to being hooked, played and handled. So the golden rule with pike is wherever possible, play them quickly, get them back into the water quickly, uh, fish for them when the water temperatures tend to be lower rather than higher. They're not quite as fierce then as people make out. I mean, you hear about uh, small dogs, children being taken, not really. Ducklings being taken by pike. Uh, listen, I'm absolutely certain they do take ducklings, um, but the thing is, they, they're a predator. They have buttons, they have to eat, and something presses those buttons and they eat. Um, but what they don't tend to do, they, they tend to have a, you know, a one move. It's not like um, maybe cheetahs or lions pursuing game on the plains. A pike will home in on its, uh, on its prey and uh, if the prey is moving rather than dead, um, they will make one explosive move towards the lure or, or the fish. Um, and that's the way they do their killing. And after that, actually, it seems that the, you know, it exhausts them a lot. I mean, you can move fish to lures and things, and then the fish will refuse to come again. And I put that down to the fact that the, you know, they have exhausted themselves in that one big lunge where they missed your lure. But going back along, I mean, we're, we're, in, we're in the Lake District, the, one of the great characters locally, William Wordsworth, the romantic poet, he, he has a pike um, attachment, doesn't he? 
Uh, yes, according to Dorothy Wordsworth Diaries. In, this, is, in, this is his sister, which he lived with. But yes, 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 yes. Uh, thereby hangs another story. <laughs> um, but basically, yes, Dorothy chronicled uh, a lot of their life uh, up here. Um, we're on the bank of Rydal Water now. They lived both at Grasmere, which is a bit further up the valley, and opposite where we're standing now. And in Dorothy's Diaries for 1800, um, she records on several occasions either herself and William or William and his friends uh, going out to fish. And it's quite obvious from reading the diaries that they're fishing both on here and on Grasmere. So they're we're fishing for pike? They're fishing for pike, yeah. Not, not trout? No, no, these lakes have never been particularly good trout lakes. Uh, in fact, you would not really waste time and effort trying to catch trout from Rydal or Grasmere. Whereas Windermere, which is all part of the same river system, the River Rothy flows and links all these lakes up, um, once upon a time was just the most stunning wild brown trout water. Now your, your remit covers fishing for the entire Lake District, doesn't it? That's, that's, uh, that's one of your things. And, and uh, I mean, what, what do you do to promote fishing here? Well, I'm, I'm a member of Windermere and Ambleside and District Angling Club, which is uh, the club that controls the water we're on now. And it's an extremely well-run fishing club. I mean, very, very forward-thinking. You know, you now get your permits electronically. They've been doing this for, for quite a long time now. In a, in a relatively sparsely populated county like Cumbria, um, you kind of quickly get to know everyone. So uh, it, it happened that uh, a couple of years ago, uh, the idea came to mind to create a festival of fishing for Cumbria um, and we kicked off last year with the first event of its kind and I'm delighted to say everyone was so happy about it that uh, we're going to be doing it again in, in 2010. But essentially we're lure fishing today, um, I've got on a, a diving plug, this floats, you wind the handle of your reel, it dives down to about three or four feet. That's the sort of thing I'd have used in the 1970s. Yeah, they still work. I mean, you've just, you know, I, I think it's more important being on top of pike when they're feeding um, rather more than, you know, having uh, wonderful lures, some of which work and some of which don't. Shove something in front of a fish, in my view, uh, that, that, that the fish is, you know, if the fish is halfway inclined, it'll take. What you have on is the, the next big thing or the latest big thing in uh, lure fishing for pike, which is called a swim bait, which has the most astonishing uh, articulated motion in the water. Um, Jeff has on here what, what, what are loosely referred to as plastics or shad. And these, these plastic lures have a wonderful uh, motion in the water. You know, the tail moves basically right and left and in a very, very fishy way. And um, you just chuck them out and wind them back at reasonably steady pace. Um, so we've all got something slightly different on with slightly different qualities. And um, well, we've, we, we collectively have yet to catch a fish together. Uh, <laughs> although I had one before we met up this morning. Yes, which was a success. Good. All right, David, thank you very much indeed. Pleasure. It's incredibly good value. Six pounds buys a day ticket on this water and the big lakes such as Windermere and Coniston offer year round fishing for free. Our lures may be state of the art, but they're not bringing in the fish. It takes another Windermere angler to show us how to do it. We'll be back here before May's angling festival. I've come back to Lowood Marina outside Windermere to prove that I got very, very lucky indeed. I think this, this might be a record. We're still waiting for the hunt ban to be repealed, so today the Coniston Foxhounds are hunting within the law. This footpack is designed to provide a vital fox control service on hill farms and it is a grand day out for locals. We probably letting about 25 go today, Yeah, somewhere in the region of 40 hounds altogether. And you're going to take yeah. a circuit up that hill up there? That's right. If anything we've got more support than what we had before. It's quite important in the hills that we do control the foxes. The fell hound there uh, Owing to the kind of terrain it has to hunt on, the mountains, uh, has to be a lot lighter made and more independent so as it can work on its own. Because uh, quite often, you know, nobody's actually with them, so they've got to do it themselves. And racy are built for going over the crags and big walls they have to contend with. And do they get, I mean, up here you could get lost for a day or so, couldn't you, at the end of the day? That must be a... Well, that's right, uh, especially if the mist comes down, which it can do, and then everybody loses contact and uh, the hounds have to find their own way back. 
but uh, most of them in the summer go out to the farms so they have a quite an idea of places where they can get back to. So would you call them England's most intelligent foxhound as a result? Yes, they seem to have, you know, quite a bit of brain on them uh, uh, to find their way back to places, which they seem to do very well. So we don't worry too much if they're missing. We know they'll turn in somewhere. Hounds move off and quickly pick up a scent. Their music rises out from among the trees and soon they are racing across the fell side. It's hard running for the whippers in. They don't use horses here. Tell us what fell hunting was like uh, when you used to come here before the ban. Well, obviously, in those days, we had to kill foxes. I mean, that was the important thing. That's a justification for it. It all started oh, a couple of hundred years ago, and every farm had their own hound or two. And they'd just meet up. They'd decide where they were going to meet on the Saturday, and they'd all bring their hounds. And slowly, it sort of coalesced into proper packs, and they'd have a huntsman who hunted them regularly. And in the old days, they'd just meet in one valley, and they'd just hunt that valley for the week. Um, and that still stays on very much as a tradition. If you look at the hunt meet cards now, you see they tend to be a week in Langdale, week in Estale, wherever, usually ending up with a hunt bull, because what you've got to remember is, up here, you haven't got the social life that you've got elsewhere, and particularly in the past, there wasn't much in the way of recreation. So the hunt in the valley was a big thing, and you had a ball at the end of it, but it wasn't sort of white tie and tails, it would just, you took your wellies off, and it was a real sort of country dance, and there was a chance for the village to get together and have a bit of a sing-song and a dance. So it's a sport, but there's a very, very serious side to it, because... As a farmer up here, you're on the edge all the time. Now, if you think about it, a fox can take a dozen lambs easily. Lambs worth maybe £30 a throw. I can remember when I was filming with Border Television a few years ago and uh, on lambing calls, and uh, well, I just tipped out a sack, 18 dead lambs. That was his summer holiday gone. You know, he could not take the wife and kids on holiday that year because a fox had just killed those lambs. But the great argument is, of course, you can go and shoot them or, you know, snare them or poison them or anything. <laughs> Just look around you. I mean, you know, and, and also remember this is a national park. We've got ramblers, we've got walkers, we've got campers, you've got people everywhere. And frankly, I mean, I shoot a lot, but I, I just know shooting foxes up here is impossible. Lamping? You're choking. Lamping on this kind of ground? You can't do it. And the only really safe way and secure way is with hounds. But also, of course, you've got your lambing calls. Now, this is the real key to it. When the season's officially ended, we're lambing quite late up here. You know, it can be April, May even. You've got a fox coming down to the lambing field, killing lambs. So what happens is farmer gets onto the kennels and says, uh, can you come round? So they come round literally at first light, four in the morning, and they'll loose the hounds in the lambing field or just beside it. The hounds will pick up the drag of that fox, up the fell, Often it's a vixen with cubs, and then it can either be bolted and shot, or if it won't bolt, they'll dig down and shoot it there. And that is crucial. I mean, that is the only sensible way you can control it. And I mean, I know people do, lots of farmers I know, they've sat up at night with a shotgun trying to get the fox. It doesn't work. Let's leave the Coniston as they check in a wood. Later in the programme, we're pheasant shooting in the south of England. First, we're on the coast of Cumbria. Ten pounds in a reference will buy you shooting over more than ten miles of coastline. Shooting here splits into two halves. There's salt marsh, like this, and there's sand. Morecambe Bay, mile upon mile of sliding, slipping quick sands where the tide can run in faster than a horse can gallop. It was death to those poor Chinese cocklers. But it's a fantastic place for wildfowling, and we're here with Grange Wildfowlers. Oh, thank you. There are more water hazards here than the 
badminton cross-country course. At one time it was walled off from the sea and uh, was a very, very productive piece of arable land until unfortunately the sea wall collapsed into the river that ran alongside it and it's never been uh, decided uh, to re-protect it. So now you just get a little bit of rough grazing and that's all that comes from it. The sand moves quite a lot, doesn't it? Uh, oh, well, the fishermen use the little road just alongside where we are to get out to go and, and shrimp and to go for the cockles. And they couldn't use that for quite a few months because instead of it just being a, a very, very gradual slope down from the marsh to the sea, it was a drop off of about 15 to 20 feet into a great big hole and so there was no access at all for them and that uh, caused quite a kerfuffle. Well, it must have some effect on the wildfowling and the birds, doesn't it? When the river's constantly moving like that and changing. Well, it, 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 it does. It means that uh, at times there are places where they have had found shelter which suddenly become exposed. Or at one time we used to get a great many widgeon and uh, pintail duck and they used to be eating off the samphire and those beds just washed away in, in a matter of a few weeks. And it, it's hard for anyone who hasn't seen it to just imagine how many tonnes of sand, you could be talking of 10,000 tonnes just in an hour disappear and it, it, it alters the whole setup and uh, the suitability of it as a habitat for the wildfowl but uh, just at present we're on a, a, a bit of a roll and the fowl are following the marsh again yeah. and uh, I should say the whole estuary again. Because mm, I used to come and collect the samphire, it's delicious, but it's, when I used to shoot up here there were very few geese, I think we had a few greys over on the Olverston side but we never saw much, that's changed hasn't it? It's been a remarkable improvement uh, but uh, as you'll know that the population of geese the grey geese, especially the pink feet, has gone up uh, many fold in the last 50 years. Uh, and now we have huge concentrations south of this uh, estuary on uh, Cochrane Marsh and down to Southport. And we get trading backwards and forwards between there and, and on the Solway marshes, and it's only probably an hour's flight for a, a goose to go there. But we get some overspill here and we. We get a bit of a mixture. There are early season there are the feral grey lags which were introduced or reintroduced here 50 years ago. And then we get uh, starting mid-September, maybe late September, we get the uh, migratory pink feet under some more grey lags. But uh, we've, we've had a few this year which for many years there were no geese at all shot on this marsh. Position of the sea channels, the river channels that when the tide is out. All these have a major, major effect and at present we, they're having a beneficial effect to, for us. So it's just really shooting is perfectly sustainable here, it's just taking off that sustainable surplus, if that even. Well I, I, I don't think we do rem remove that surplus, I, I think we're just chipping away at the edge but we are perfectly happy with that. As you know we, we do have uh, conservation areas here, sanctuaries uh, and Quite frankly, we don't find many more fowl in those sanctuary areas than we do on the open marsh. It isn't as if that is their only piece of uh, peace and quiet. They are happy with it, the situation as it is, and so uh, long may it continue. It's good to talk about conserving fowl. What about conserving people? I mean, I've heard it can be pretty dangerous out here on the sands, can't it? Well, uh, we uh, old dinosaurs and the older hands in the, the club, when we have our meetings, we we interview people at great length who come to apply for membership and I think we enjoy frightening one another as much as anything, telling the tales of... Every one of us has had a, a frightening incident where the tide has come in maybe half an hour earlier than we expected or we've got to a ditch, which we, uh, a gutter which we pa passed over quite happily going out onto the sands when we came back it was all uh, really sticky and sinky and, it, well, it exercises the mind quite considerably if you get stuck in one of those with a big tide rushing towards you. But have we ever lost any wildfowlers out there? Uh, not permanently. <laughs> they've, been, they've been missing for a few hours, but uh, they've always yeah. turned up all right. But uh, one can't be too careful, and we really do insist that with people who are joining the club that they, 
go accompanied for quite some while and, and they do the homework to make sure because it, it isn't something to be played around with. Or, or we, we are having a laugh now about it but uh, it's a real, real danger and they've got to be aware of that the whole time. It's a sort of an eerie place at night as well out there. I mean, there's, I've heard of dobbies and things like this and, you know, will-o'-the-wisps appearing on the marsh. It's a spooky sort of place at night. It, it, it can be, and it's especially if suddenly there's one of these birds call when, you, when you're not expecting anything, you haven't spoken to anyone for several hours and suddenly there's a, a high-pitched squealing sort of a sound from one of the... A waders or maybe maybe a goose calling. It, it can it can be a bit spooky, but uh, one gets used to it. No one's had any bad experiences out there. Well, I don't think they want to admit that they were frightened and they thought they'd seen a ghost. So whether they did or they didn't, I don't know, Jeff. <laughs> a field reveals why this has become such a fabulous wildfowling destination. There are more than a thousand geese here, according to the gamekeeper, and in half an hour's time. They're going to fly over the Leven Estuary, the river that flows out of Windermere. We move on to those dangerous sands to put out guns. This was the main route south from the Lake District to Lancaster and whole coaches were lost in the rising tide. Cartmill Priory overlooks that treacherous route and many people who died there are buried here. As light fades and the last glimmer of sun melts behind the Sir John Barrow monument, the lights of the Glaxo factory provide the glow that light our path. Well, a lot of geese went over last night, but none went over us. I'm not complaining. For a tenner, that was fantastic sport. And I got a snipe. Perhaps if I'd spent uh, less time talking and more time shooting, we'd have all done a lot better. You can do this too. Basque runs a wildfowling permit scheme. At any of 30 clubs around the United Kingdom, Basque members can go out for a day's shooting for as little as 10 quid. Now, had duck gone over us, we'd have been in a better position to know how to shoot them had we been to West London Shooting School, 300 miles in that direction. And that's where we're going now. We're at the spectacular West London Shooting School, home school of one of the greatest shooting instructors ever, Percy Stanbury, before and after the Second World War. His heir and successor is Alan Rose, who's here today. Now, yeah. Alan, we're in one of the boggy places here, yeah. and we're here to talk about uh, duck. Yes. yes. Now, there's one now. Yeah, there's one just dropped in there. Did you see it? Yeah. Now, tell me, tell me, tell me about duck here. Uh, well, duck here, you've got two or three different sorts of ducks. I mean, you could stand around a pond where they rear ducks and they just push them off and they go round and round and they shoot them. Or you've got the ducks that you stand around a pond at the evening time and you wait for them to come in. Or you've got the evening or the morning flush where you walk up to the lake and they all go off in one bait and it's just bang bang, they've gone the world. But the tame ones, they will come back. But basically, evening time to me is one of the best ones. You, you see everything then. Now, shooting teal on Saturday, I, I, I saw them coming round and round coming and round. Coming round, yes, a cloud yes. of teal. Oh, uh, yes, yes. And, and we, can, we can replicate this here with clays? Almost, almost, yes, yes. yes. But like I said, with, with, with ducks, especially in the evening time, how many people are around shooting, you can't shoot them down too low as they're coming in. You've got to be still shot up above you. But at the same time, if you try to shoot a wild duck too soon, it will put the rest off. I always was told let the first half a dozen or so drop in first, then let the other ones come in, you can shoot them coming in, and then you can also shoot the other ones coming out as well. That's already landed. That's and how I was always told. If there's three of you around this pond, there's a safety issue as well, isn't there? Oh yeah, yeah. You, like I said, they've still got to be shot up in the sky. You can't shoot them coming down into the lake. Not that low anyway. You know. Right, 
Let's right. go on, give it a okay, go. Okay, we'll give it a go then. Yeah. Right, Adam, you're, you're hidden in your hide beside your pond, waiting for the duck. One's coming in now. Show, show us the right way without using a cartridge. How do you take that bird? Well, uh, to take that bird, I mean, you basically you'll be down a bit waiting for them to come in. But once that bird, once the duck's come in close enough to you, not too wide because if they're really wild bird, and then basically you stand up again and you've got to shoot it before it gets past you again. Yes? If it's dropping, you can't, like I say, shoot it into the lake because you've got other people maybe around the other side shooting. You know, it's different if you're on your own, you know, but basically it's got to be shot up there in the sky. Yeah. Now, supposing it flares, as some of them do, they go off again when they see you stand oh, up. Well, then you've got to make sure you've got to shoot up a little bit higher on them because most people will shoot them underneath and then you get them in the legs and you get the runners, spend all day long with the dog pig trying to find them, yeah, diving, yes. Uh, you've got a Labrador, it's a good swimming dog, ideal oh, good for good swimming dog, dogs, yes. <laughs> now show me, show me somebody who's crouched in a hide and who's making all the mistakes in the book. Ah, uh, well, it's, it, I don't know, what mistakes is there? I mean, a mistake again, it, it's just, uh, you know, it's still not putting that gun in properly, you know. Uh, so mount above all, get that oh, right. Yeah, yeah, it's got any any shot gun's got to be mounted properly, not standing back on yourself. Do you recommend yeah. people at home picking a point on the wall and dry mounting to that point to learn oh, how to mount? Well, it's don't forget it's a dry, it's a point, yes. But when you when you're moving the gun mounting it, what what object you're shooting at normally is moving. So I always say no. Practice moving the muzzle mount. Once you mount, split second after you, you should be shooting that bird. Yes, high or low. Yes. Um, Duck shooting on a, a, a pond like this, we've got, we've got teal and mallard at this time of year. Teal and mallard, yeah. Might be the old Canada, but yes. Basically teal and mallard, yes. Any difference between geese and duck? Uh, yeah, geese fly a little bit faster than you think they do because it's a big, big old bird. You think, oh, that doesn't need no lead. But I always look at the goose's head, or even the duck, really. But the goose's head, that is a bird to me. You forget the body. Look at his head and you're giving the head the lead, not the bird. Yes. I've heard people say treat the head like a snipe. That's right, yeah. If you love our videos and, well, who doesn't? And you've got a friend who doesn't have the internet, then for Christmas, why not give them a subscription? Every month we'll send two or even two and a half hours of our programming to them on DVD. Now, we've just seen how to shoot ducks, we're off to shoot real pheasants. We've been filming Canal Game Farm over the past six months, all leading up to the moment of truth, the day we see their birds fly. Every time we've visited them so far we've had glorious weather, but at the Peasmar shoot in East Sussex where Franny is a syndicate member, and of course supplier of all the birds, all the wind and rain has arrived at one time. But it isn't going to dampen the spirits of this friendly syndicate, which enjoys what's described as Europe's premier shoot, apparently. Their pride and joy is the new lodge, which is thanks to everyone just mucking in. The guests that come here, on our shoot, they really enjoy it because it's more of a fun shoot as such. All different backgrounds too? Yep, all different backgrounds, working people, they're all different trades and different things, which is quite handy. <laughs> well, you've seen our new lodge, that's our new lodge you've come in today that, uh, you know, it's like we've got plumbers, carpenters, decorators, we've got all, so we do everything ourselves. So. Always used to have them in the family. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With a break in the weather, we leave the comfort of the new shooting lodge and gamekeeper Spencer talks us through the do's and don'ts. A little bit wet, but we'll be all right. Um, we've got a few guest guns today, taking other people's guns. Um, we know uh, no ground game today. That's including foxes, um, magpies, crows, jays allowed. There's even a mention for Franny's white pheasants. There were about 70 marker birds put down here this year, so it could be an expensive day for someone. 
In convoy we head off and a few minutes later arrive at the first drive. The wind may be howling and the rain lashing down, but gamekeeper Kevin, on his boss's ticket today, still looks the part as he stands by his peg, framed by a sturdy oak. He even gets a few birds. But then it gets silly and we have to retreat back to the lodge and light the fire. Even though it feels like we've just had breakfast, the steam starts rising on the curry, the chilli and the dogs. Uh, we decided to have dinner now and then we're going to go straight from dinner to our next drive which should be about half an hour hopefully. Because it's been so wet we've got to, we've got to have it now otherwise we'll never get it done otherwise. This is, this is not curry now, this is um, sweet Chili pie carne. Carne. Hold on, hold on. Come on spinning. Eventually play is resumed and we head off for some lovely ground looking a bit like the wacky racers. This one is a more successful drive, and Franny has a chance to tell us how the day's going for him. <laughs> not, not shooting particularly well. It's difficult with this wind for the guys because it's um, a walk one, stand one shoot. The guys really, um, we do our best to beat and try and run a beating line, but it's, it's hard work. Um, and the conditions today are making it doubly hard. I mean, I ideally need the wind coming from the west um, rather than the east. Um, it doesn't really help our drives. But you can see some fantastic um, pheasants just come off the last drive. We call this big cover. I think this is probably as good as any drive in the in the county, really. Your when birds, of course. Well. Our birds, of course. Yeah, they're flying well. Everyone seems happy with them. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's hard work, but it's not too bad. As the birds are brought back to the gator, there's a notable size difference between the cock birds, and it's all down to the varieties Franny's given them this year. Um, these birds here have got a bit of Kansas. A Michigan in them, a Michigan blue back. But this old boy is, he is a, just a common ring neck. Nice big bird, a lot bigger than the crosses that we've got. I mean, that's a good indication that bird there, the Michigan to the ring neck. There's an awful lot of difference between those two pheasants. He's um, ideal for deep valley shoots where the birds don't have to do a lot of work. Lowland ground, you need something like the the hybrid blueback, which is a bit smaller, but flies a lot harder and a lot faster. And you're saying, see, see the difference in those two birds. It's probably about a pound in weight. It's been a wild day, but a good one. But for one of the syndicate, his day is going to end with less than he started with. Robin is shaving his hair off for the charity Help for Heroes. I just had my hair shaved and hopefully make a few shillings for uh, no wonderful troops who are fighting for us, I suppose. Hopefully, anyway. Have you done anything like this before? Never done it in my life. I suppose I had a haircut yesterday in the red time. So it's a good way of having a free haircut as well. What do you think? <laughs> my ears are going to stick out, but that's... <laughs> that's why I wear this hat, put it right on my ears. Let's right, see man. your mop at the moment. Oh. That's not bad for 57, is it? Look, all my own here. I know that. What's your end? It's going to look good. <laughs> <laughs>